So what we're going to talk about now is just a little bit about some different neurotransmitters. Uh, this is one of the areas, at least for the exam, the final, uh, I would say put a little bit of time into this, know some examples of these things, but I'm not going to turn this into a neurobiology kind of describe to me all the different types of neurotransmitters, their classes, and everything else like that. I mean, all said and done, there is hundreds of neurotransmitters. Uh, these are ones that are released at the synaptic cleft and can bring about changes in that receiving cell. Again, a number of major groups in these ones that we're going to worry about. This does not take a long period of time and most neurons can release at least a couple different types of neurotransmitters and again, depending on the receptor and what types of channels that receptor is connected to, uh, a neuron can respond to many types of neurotransmitters as well. Some of these changes that a neurotransmitter would bring about would be something called an ionotropic effect. Uh, this binds to receptors and actually brings about a change in which ions can flow in or out of the cell. Again, very quick, very short lasting. Uh, a lot of what we've talked about so far have been this idea of an ionotropic type of synapse. Uh, acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, for example, glutamate up in the brain. You could kind of talk about some of these ones as being an ionotropic effect. Metabotropic effects, these are going to be ones where it binds to a receptor and changes something about the metabolism of the receiving cell that is going to bring about a longer lasting effect in the cell. So uh, some of the events like it talks about here, hunger, fear, thirst, anger, those are definitely ones there. A lot of times we refer to these neurotransmitters as being neuromodulators because they're not directly exciting or inhibiting something, but just bring about a change in that postsynaptic cell. Uh, something like caffeine, for example, would be a good example of a neuromodulator. So they can increase or decrease the release of a neurotransmitter or the clearance of a neurotransmitter. Uh, definitely alters the effects on that postsynaptic cell. So some different classes of neurotransmitters would be something I want to talk about next. We've talked about acetylcholine a little bit already at the neuromuscular junction. Depending on where we're talking about, and we'll see this with the... Uh, uh, autonomic nervous system. Acetylcholine can be an inhibitory or an, an excitatory neurotransmitter. It really depends upon what it's connected to. Uh, it's obviously from a motor neuron, it's excitatory, but we see it sometimes in the autonomic nervous system being an inhibitory one here. Another major class would be these kind of amino acid based type of neurotransmitters. So these are kind of slightly modified uh, amino acids, things like glutamate, glycine, aspartate, aspartate, for example. Uh, monoamines are some of the best known ones here. These ones are ones that are derived from certain types of amino acids, but the subgroup, the catecholamines, so an epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, some of these really well-known neurotransmitters. Uh, there's also some things called uh, neuropeptides, which are chains of amino acids, would uh, contain some of the ones that's explaining here. Uh, so to me, knowing some of these main classes, what they are, and an example in them would be not a bad idea. Uh, there's also other things like uh, gaseous ones, like uh, the nitric oxide, for example. So these are ones that show you some of these amino acid-based ones, so glutamate, uh, so showing you like glutamic acid versus glutamate and how it gets converted to GABA, uh, one of the more common neurotransmitters that you'll see in the brain. Uh, so it shows you some examples of that. Acetylcholine, showing you this one here. Peripheral nervous system, this is all those neuromuscular junctions. We also see it in the autonomic nervous system quite a bit. Uh, the monoamines are based off of tyrosines. So dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine are examples of these ones. You can see how they're all based off of this basic structure of the tyrosine, a slightly modified tyrosine. You can see how these are all off that basic building block. Serotonin, uh, again, another one of these monoamines, kind of based off of that as well. Slightly different starting point, but a lot of well-known effects with serotonin in the brain. So this one definitely plays a role in uh, aggression and mood. Uh, definitely mess with when we're talking about antipsychotics and can get overstimulated and things with like LSD, S, ecstasy. Uh, 
So some of those uh, more hallucinogenics would definitely act on this neurotransmitter. You can see it's going off of tryptophan versus tyrosine, but another one of these modified amino acid based ones. So neuromodulators, like I said, these are ones that are not actually stimulating ion channels directly, but are altering the cell's effects. So we can get things like facilitation, giving you a greater response in here. So it might increase receptors, increase the amount of neurotransmitter that stays in the cleft, inhibit reuptake of a neurotransmitter, for example. You can also get inhibition with neuromodulators, ones where less receptors or to cause increased clearance of that particular neurotransmitter in the synapse. And again, this is one of the things that neuromodulation will definitely do is alter what's going on in that synaptic cleft. Anything that either increases or decreases the amount of time a neurotransmitter is in the synaptic cleft can alter its activity. Uh, again, generally what we want to do is that after a short period of time, anything that we release into the synapse, we want it to be either retaken up or clear from the synapse because we don't want one signal to cause this sustained release or sustained presence of a neurotransmitter in there that continues to affect the cell. So much like what we talked about with neuromuscular junction, we want to clear that acetylcholine after we give the signal so that muscle doesn't stay locked up. Uh, same thing with the nervous system and in the brain. We don't want a neurotransmitter sending a signal. We send it once and it stays in there and stays active for hours and hours. That would not allow processing to happen very easily. Uh, again, sometimes we take an enzyme and break it down. Sometimes we have a cell that's taking this back in. So we have pumps like with nitric oxide that we reuptake it. It gets recycled and brought back in. Uh, certain drugs for depression like serotonin ones uh, with depression, sometimes they will actually have reuptake inhibitors of serotonin that lets that serotonin stay in the synapse a little bit longer, for example, uh, could be used on that one. And again, ways that we have drugs that can alter this. Uh, again, we want the stuff removed because if we kept it in the neuromuscular junction, if we keep it in a synapse, it's gonna continue to get that cell. So sometimes this diffuses in the blood, gets an enzyme that breaks it down, gets pumped back into glial cells, gets pumped back into the presynaptic cell. These are all ways we can clear things like acetylcholine or other neurotransmitters from those synaptic clefts. What's kind of interesting on this stuff, and I just do a little bit of this, uh, if you were to take uh, Dr. Slish's uh, class, you could get into a lot more of this with uh, the different, uh, the recreational drugs class, but Schizophrenia and some of these drug effects are definitely related to neurotransmitters. There's a lot of evidence that schizophrenia is really overstimulation of dopamine synapses. So this is kind of supported by drugs that decrease dopamine, reduce severity, drugs that cause an increase in dopamine can sometimes bring about schizophrenic conditions. What is interesting about this though is again, for the person that's experiencing this, it is as real as anything else. Your brain is getting this signal, it's breaking down the signal and telling you what it's experiencing. Just because we don't see or hear if you don't have schizophrenia, to those people that do, the effects that it is having are very, very real, as real as anything else. So again, it's kind of interesting how this can ex affect your experience. Uh, drugs can definitely also act as neuromodulators or things that are going to increase or decrease the amount of this uh, particular neurotransmitter being there. So amphetamines actually stimulate increased release of dopamine. Uh, part of the reason they have their effects, that stimulatory effect. Cocaine, on the other hand, blocks the reuptake of things like dopamine and norepinephrine, which is why it can lead to increased heart rates because that gets out there and then it just stays in the synapse. Uh, Ritalin acts kind of like uh, cocaine, but in a much more controlled fashion, uh, obviously. Uh, ecstasy is another one here. Releases low amounts of dopamine at low doses that act as a stimulant. At really high levels of ecstasy, you are going to get a lot more serotonin and can lead to hallucinogenic type of properties. Uh, can also, because of that, lead to issues with depression because you get used to that amount being in there and when you stop taking this, it's removed and can be an issue. Uh, nicotine acts on nicotinic receptors and can facilitate increased dopamine release. Different opiate drugs 
definitely can act on specific receptors to dull pain, increase relaxation, things like epine uh, sorry, morphine, heroin. These act on these receptors that are normally there for normal brain peptides called endorphins. These are ones that act on those ones there uh, and can definitely inhibit the release of GABA indirectly with these endorphins. Uh, oh, dopamine, not dopamine, opiates can act on these same receptors. And then there's things like THC, the active ingredient of marijuana. We have endocannabinoid receptors in the brain. Uh, these can act on those. Uh, so different receptors than some of the other ones we're talking about here can attach to those receptors. And because of where these are in the brain, that's why you can sometimes get that altered sense of time, memory impairment. Uh, these definitely inhibit the release of certain things like glutamate and GABA. And hallucinogenic drugs a lot of times uh, are very similar in shape to serotonin. Uh, so like the magic mushrooms, the cybacillin, uh, acid or LSD, like lysergic acid, is a very much a uh, serotonin mimic. So they can cause effects by greatly stimulating those synapses. And again, leading to you seeing things that technically aren't there, but your experience is going to be very real to you. So those are just give you some ideas. I mean, to me, that's kind of more of a fun one where we kind of talk about some of these different neurotransmitters. Again, just giving you an idea of what these can do if they're slightly altered. But again, normal functioning, these are being released at certain amounts, being regulated tightly. Uh, different drugs can obviously alter how they have their effects. I will talk to you next time.